Hey there, Nectarthacus here. In this video, we're going to go over how to take all the exported environment variables from your shell and make them available to a Docker container. We're also going to do this in such a way where you don't need to hard code each environment variable name, as well as not even use the env file property that is available to Docker. So just as a quick refresher here, if you do a Docker container run here, let's run the official bash image. Latest version is fine. We don't need to define a specific version. And we run the env command that is going to output all the available environment variables to that specific container. Keep in mind, you know, this env command is not running on my dev box directly, this is running in the context of the container. That's why we see very little uh, defined here. But if I run the env command directly on WSL2 here, basically my dev box or the Docker host, then we are going to see a much different output. These are all the available environment variables to my current shell. And yeah, in this video, we're going to go over how to inject quite a few of these or whatever ones that you want right into your container without having to do too much stuff here. But uh, yeah, let's just go over very quickly here briefly of, you know, how you can inject environment variables into a container or basically make them available. So one common approach is using the dash E flag here, and you can do something like, you know, name equals Nick or whatever. And then you can just rerun the command here and see that the name environment variable is available. So now inside of your Docker container, if you had some script or application running, you can reference this name environment variable, get the value of Nick, whatever it is, and you're good to go. And uh, this E flag is very handy. And by the way, our end result is still going to use the E flag. We just won't need to pass things in manually here. But uh, yeah, there's you know a way for you to run uh, the E flag multiple times. And then you can see here we have name equals Nick, hello equals world. And you can basically add as many E flags as you want for however many uh, environment variables that you need. But you know, one thing is, let's say that you have 20 environment variables, right? Or maybe you want to make this command a little bit easier to share with others. So a lot of uh, folks will end up just using an env file. So for example, you can do dash env dash file here and just pop in an env file. And then you can do that and you'll see that uh, nothing works here. Why? Because I put this flag in the wrong spot here. Or actually, I got rid of the bash there when I was backspacing things out. So yeah, let's go and rerun that again. And uh, actually, let me clear that just so we have some room here. And uh, yeah, again, this one. <laughs> but you can see here that there is an environment variable cool hello world here and another one called app underscore name Nick. And that is because in this current directory, I do have an env file that I created just beforehand on video. And we can see both of those environment variables are here. It being named that env isn't super important, uh, but that is a pretty standard convention just to have an env file that named env, but you can technically name it whatever you want. But uh, yeah, that's two standard ways to, you know, make environment variables available to Docker. And oftentimes, you know, even when using Docker Compose, like I'll be using env underscore file, that's a Docker Compose property to pass in a file. You know, if you've seen some of my example Dockerized web apps, which I'll leave a link to in the description, you know, that's a pattern I very much use a lot. And when we were taking a look here at the other way of doing it with the E flags, like, you know, Docker Compose has that environment property where you can pass in basically a hash of uh, key value pairs for the environment. You know, that's a very standard way to do that stuff. But yeah, recently I had a real world use case come up where I wanted to be able to basically pass in a whole bunch of E flags, but I didn't want to have to go in and like, you know, write E for all of these like 20 different times. And uh, maybe I'll go over the use case of that after we go over the implementation, just so we can start diving into some real stuff soon here. But um, yeah, I did prepare one little bit of code here um, before I made the video here. Basically, you know, this is what I am using to currently do this parsing, but we're going to break it down in this video and kind of go over things line by line. But uh, let's first just run this thing or let me run it real quick so you can see how it works. So if I run that demo script here, this is outputting basically uh, a list of specific environment variables that exist on my dev boxes env output. So if I run that env command again, notice here that I'm running WSL2. So, you know, just for this example, for the sake of the video, you know, I didn't put like underscore app and cool or whatever. Um, yeah, we can see here that we have a couple different environment variables that start with WSL underscore. And we also have a couple with XDG, XDG here. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't have those environment variables available if you run the env command in your box, but chances are you'll find something with some pattern, right? Like FCF underscore, uh, there's like less underscore and yeah, Tmux maybe, yep, there we go. So whatever, you know, you can pick out whatever you want. And the idea here though is, you know, just in case you don't want to inject every single env output, like you don't want to have all of these environment variables, then we're just doing some basic filtering here. Like for example, this grep command. Yeah, let's uh, maybe tear this thing down and just run it manually a little bit just to see how it works. So in this case with grep, we're saying, you know, lines that start with this or, you know, WSL or XDG. And then they also have uh, an underscore and then match any character and then ends the line you know, that's going to give us our matches here. Now, of course, you know, if I didn't want to be 
um, this strict, you know, this doesn't need to be this defined, right? Like you can just technically just even do this and that's going to be fine in this specific case here. But uh, yeah, I like to make my reg regular expressions a little bit more specific on what we have. So I prefer using this style here, even though it's a little bit more of typing here. But uh, yeah, let's run that again. And we can see that the return value here has both the keys and the values here. And we have the equal sign in the middle. And uh, that's what the cut command is doing here to break this down. So we can say we want to cut on basically the equal sign as a delimiter, and we want to grab the first result here, which is just going to give us the key. So if we grab the second result there, then we would get the values. But in our case, we don't really care too much about the value. We only care about the key. And uh, yeah, let's rewind that a bit, go back to the one here. And then, yeah, just reminder, this is what we're getting here, just the key names by, by themselves. But when we run that Docker container command for the run command, we want to do dash E and then the name of the thing, dash E, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what that set command here is doing at the very end. So if we do the set command here and we do uh, at the start of the line, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to replace the start of the line with dash E and a space and that's it. And then if we run that, then it's going to go to the start of the line here. And you can see here like the before and the after, and it's just going to add the dash E with a space. Great. So now you put that all together here and you know, I just echoed the, the variable that we're assembling here. Uh, that's it, we get the output that we want. And if we run a Docker container run here, and instead of passing in the env file here with like n file, we can really just run our demo script here in a subshell and just, uh, if I can type, that's it, done. And what is it going to do? Well, it is going to run that script that we just had and basically convert all of those dash e's for each environment variable and we can see them here. We have WSL distro name and uh, the XDG cache one. You know, these environment variables weren't, were not available before. So I'm gonna clear my screen in a second here, but you know, look, right XDG here and over here, over here, over here. And then we have the WSL distro one. And if we rerun the same commands here without running this script here, that is going to produce a much different output. You can see that they are not listed here. Why? Because we just inserted them running uh, running it this way. So yeah, this is pretty handy, right? So the use case for maybe wanting to do this, because you might think about this and just be like, well, you know, why don't you just put all those environment variables in an env file? And, you know, functionality wise, that would work quite well. But, you know, the specific use case that I had was I was preparing basically a script that will take a production database well, more specifically, a snapshot of a production database. And inside of a CI pipeline, it is going to take that snapshot, it's gonna create a new, essentially a dev DB out of that snapshot, like a development version of that database. And then it's going to run a little script that is gonna take a whole bunch of SQL commands and you know import that into that new dev DB to basically sanitize um, all sorts of, you know, PII, like personally identifiable data. So, you know, getting rid of customer names and, you know, bank accounts and, you know, all sorts of different things like that. And all of this is running inside of a CI pipeline. And when it comes to setting up variables inside of a CI pipeline, so, you know, if you're using something like GitHub Actions or GitLab or Bitbucket or something else, you know, they usually have this option to be able to have secure environment variables. So these environment variables are, you know, encrypted at rest, you can't see them in the UI. And typically, you know, when you run your pipeline, like if you had, um, you know, like my secret or something like that, you know, if in inside of your pipeline, you just tried to echo my secret or something to try to see, like, you know, what is a, the value of this, like the pipeline uh, log output is smart enough to know to redact that, like, like it's not going to show you the value. Um, it depends on what provider you're using, but oftentimes you'll just end up seeing like literally the variable name, like just like this. So you won't see the secret there. So, you know, it kind of felt a little bit dirty to me to take all of those environment variables that are defined as uh, CI secrets and then kind of just, you know, dump them out to a file like this. Like I could have totally have done um, something like this, right? Like take the whole output of ENV and kind of just write it to an ENV file. I'm going to do it with an ENV2 here, but uh, yeah, if we look here, at, I guess I can open it up on here. You know, that just created a new file here that has all the environment variables dumped out. So like it would have been like easier to maybe do that to have that, but you know, I didn't want to dump all these files out on disk within the pipeline because yeah, there's like, you know, more things that can go wrong with accidentally logging stuff and stuff like that. Now, of course, you probably want to also run the grep command that we were looking at before here to filter things out. But in any case, the use case for me specifically called for a solution like this. And that is the solution in the end. And um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. So there's like 20 different environment uh, variables. And if you're wondering like, you know, how that all pieced together, uh, I did make a video in the past about this one tool called ENV substitute. And yeah, well, that video goes into all the details, but you know, details of this specific use case was, uh, or real world use case was, I had all of these SQL scripts or yeah, just SQL queries inside of uh, SQL files. And instead of hard coding all the secrets in there, you know, I just had things like, you know, 
like, you know, DB password or whatever the environment variable is like inside of my SQL file and SQL, you know, can interpolate environment variables. But, you know, if you pipe it or pass it through ENV substitute, then it can. So basically I took those, you know, uh, scripted out SQL files, ran them through ENV substitute, got the real vial, uh, values in there, and then it was all good to go. So it was kind of a little fun example of just like, you know, using uh, little tools all together to make things work. And yeah, that whole entire like dev DB script is running inside of Docker. So I needed a way to get, you know, all the environment variables uh, running into a Docker container because it's using Python, like the AWS SDK, the MySQL clients, uh, that's um, what the client is using for their database, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, anyways, I don't want to get into too rambly about the, door, the gory details of that. I just wanted to let you know the use case of why I decided to go this route instead of using the env file. So, you know, let me know in the comments below if you have any use cases where you might use something like this. And uh, yeah, if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. It really does help a lot. If you have any questions about any of this, let me know in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you in the next video.